Hello and welcome to Public Affairs Forum. I'm Carolyn Griminger. Our program's mission is to serve, nourish the mind and spirit and serve social justice. Our forums occur on most Sundays at noon and are free and open to the public. We encourage you to attend. Our church is located physically at 4700 Grover Avenue. For more information about our Public Affairs Forum, you can go to our church website at www.austinuu.org. Today our speaker is Tommy L. Wyatt. He is going to be speaking on East Austin's community newspaper and the Youth Brigade. Mr. Wyatt was born in Point Blank, Texas and graduated from Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School in Lubbock. He graduated from Bishop College in Marshall, did graduate work at the University of Washington in Seattle and served two years in the United States Army. In 1973, he founded the Villager newspaper, which he has owned and published since then. The Villager is a community newspaper addressing the needs and issues of East Austin. He will discuss the role of community newspapers, his voice on the Villager, and his work with the Youth Brigade, an organization that works with young people. Mr. Wyatt has served on many boards and commissions for the city of Austin and Travis County, including the Private Industry Council, Austin Tomorrow Planning Committee, Austin Cable Commission, and the East Austin Street Village Association. Let's welcome Mr. Wyatt. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's afternoon now, isn't it? <laughs> well, thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me to come this morning. Uh, Trying to figure out where to start. She covered, she covered that point blank thing. That's usually my, my, my surprise for people. Uh, who, anybody in here ever been to point blank, Texas? Didn't think so. <laughs> How about Lubbock? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's usually my surprise point blank deal. But I have to say that my mother left there as soon as she could. She left there when I was a baby with me on her hip and never to go back again. Uh, I think she, we, she came, she grew up in a small town, in a little town, West Texas called Stamford, and she ended up in Point Blank, and, and it was smaller than Stamford, so she couldn't handle it. However, uh, she finally made her way back to Stamford. I went to elementary school there, but I, we moved to Lubbock uh, in the early 50s, and I graduated from high school in Lubbock. Uh, I arrived in Austin in 1962, uh, immediately after I got out of the military. Back in those days, when you were drafted, that was back in the old draft days, when you were drafted, if you were drafted off of a job, they were obligated to hire you back to your same position when you came out, of, out of, when you were released from the Army, particularly if you got out, got out with a good, what they call it, good, good behavior. But when I got back to Lubbock, they didn't have a job. I worked for an insurance company called, it was called the Atlanta Life Insurance Company. Home office was in Atlanta, Georgia and had a district office there, but they didn't have a place for me at that time in Lubbock. So they said, well, I, we get two choices. You can go to Austin, and I, was, I had been trained to be a staff manager. You can go to Austin to be a staff manager, or you can join the uh, audit team. And the audit team traveled around the country to all our district offices, you know, doing the audit of, of the branches, to try to make sure they were doing the right thing and so forth. And I said, well, I, I hadn't been home uh, since I got out of military, since, since I was drafted, I stayed in the Army for two years. I never took a leave of Afton because I was up, way up in Washington, and, and you had to take two days to get back home. And by the time I got home, it was time to go back, <laughs> so I never took a leave. So I told them that I, I wanted to get a place where I could settle down and uh, probably start creating some kind of longevity. And so they sent me to Austin, and I was, came here, and I was staff manager. And I worked as staff manager there for... Uh, about two years. And while I was there, a good friend of mine who had started an insurance agency uh, here uh, asked me to uh, join his agency as a partner in that insurance agency. And great opportunity. I was young and hot-blooded, so I took him up in his office. And he and I, we worked together there until he got old enough. So he, he want, he's trying to get rid of all his, his businesses. He's, he's ready to retire. And so... Uh, uh, we sold that agency back to the company, uh, and uh, I started on my own, and I formed an independent insurance agency of myself where we did full-line insurance 
fine character life and this sort of thing. And that's what I was doing when, when the, uh, I got this newspaper book. And what happened uh, when I came to Austin, I had never been to Austin before, didn't know anybody in Austin. I finally found out that I did know one lady here who had gone to high school with me a couple of years before I did. And I ran into her because she came here to go to Houston Tillerson University, Houston Tillerson College at the time. And uh, she, she stayed after then. But that was the only person I found I knew here. And so I looked forward to getting, they had a newspaper called the Capital City Argus, was was the black community paper when I came. And that was the way I acquainted myself with the community, who the people were, what they did, how they did it, and so forth. And, and would find out how to communicate in the community. Unfortunately, the lady who, who was the, who was the uh, managing editor of that paper was playing bridge one night, had a heart attack and died. And, you know, and that was very traumatic for the community because that was the, community, the paper that a lot of people looked forward to. Uh, we had a saying back in, back in those days, and, and it's still true today, that if you want to find out good news about the black community, you won't find it on, on the first section of the daily paper. It'll be on page 12, 14, 15, somewhere back there, but it won't be, won't be on the front page. If you want to find out bad news about the African American community, it'll be on the front page. And so, and that was kind of the philosophy that we took. Uh, the new people came in, and uh, myself and a couple other people who had been writing periodically for, for, for the August, uh, went down and offered our assistance. And they didn't think that we were writing the right type of thing that they wanted to cover. So they said, thank you, but no thank you. And so at that point, I decided to start, try to start a newspaper. Not to go into it full time. I was going to run it. But like most newspaper owners I knew, they didn't work full time in the newspaper business. They did other things. They were dentists. They were lawyers. You know, they were real estate agents, whatever. And the, and the newspaper was, was a sideline. And so that's why I went into it as a sideline. I was lucky enough to, to uh, my, my wife, my late wife, she had uh, started a publication called the Black Registry. And it, and it was a listing of black owned and managed businesses in, in Austin. And one of the things we, we had a problem doing when we went out and talked to people about them doing business with black businesses, they said, well, we would do that, but we don't know where to find them. So she compiled this, 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 this book, this telephone directory of black owned and managed businesses in the city. And when they, when they said that, we just had them a copy of the book. You know, whatever profession you're looking for, they're, they're in this book. We produced that book until 2015. We started in, in 1970, and we produced it annually until 2015. And uh, we're th thinking about getting back to it, but the community had dispersed so much, we, we, we're having a hard time now trying, <laughs> trying to find everybody and get them in there, and also for them to see the need <coughs> of that publication. I was lucky enough when doing that, that book, I had a guy who was a photographer, and, and he would go out when we would get a new business, we, he'd go out and take photographs for, when we put the ads together and this sort of thing, take photographs for us. Uh, well, his wife happened to, happened to have been the uh, daughter of the dean of UT Journalism Department. How about that? <laughs> and uh, she had lost her job because of inspiration of marriage. He was black, she was white, and she worked with Austin American Statesman, and she and, and three other women were fired because they had mixed race boyfriends, uh, uh, you know, or husbands or whatever. And she came in and offered her services. And, and she was our first managing editor. Did a good job of doing that. Her, her husband continued to be our photographer. And, uh, but as we went down the road, uh, I think he, was a, he wanted to be a, become a partner. And, and I didn't do, I, I wasn't very good at partnerships. And so I said, no, I, we can work together, but I don't think I want that responsibility. Uh, that, sideline, whatever, I already had the business. So anyway, uh, he left, and, and so, but she stayed. He said he wouldn't work for me anymore as a photographer, but she stayed, and she was the one that helped me got the business started and, and, uh, and established. And we went started with the same people we had in the black registry, the directory, we went to them. And so we, we, we and they would say, God, I'm glad, you know, we, we need to advertise more than once a year, because the registry was once a year publication. We advertise more than once a year, and so uh, glad you're doing this. And that was our support, was the black businesses 
uh, in Austin that's got them started. And I don't know if you sold advertising, but unless you're in a established business, advertisers don't want to do business with you because you have no proven track record. How can you have a proven track record when you have when you just started? You know, and but anyway, that took off and, and so after about two years I found myself deeply engrossed in the newspaper business and I've been a, a newspaper a publisher ever since. I uh, got rid of the uh, insurance agency and uh, that's that's what we did. Now newspaper industry we, we have an organization called called the National Newspaper Publishers Association, which is a conglomerate of all the black newspapers in the country. You know, uh, the, all the newspaper associations have associations, but this one is specifically for black-owned newspapers. And right now, we have about 300 newspapers around the country that are members of, the, of this organization. Uh, it took me about three or four years before they let me in. Again, they wanted me have to prove my track record whether or not I was worthy to be a member of the organization. And we, we, we overcame that. And we have two, two conferences per year, one in January, one in June, where we share information about what we're doing. And where we are right now it is everybody's question, the, the daily papers, the monthly publication, whatever. Everybody is trying to figure out uh, the future of print media. No, we don't have an answer to that yet. You know? But I think what we've that defied, decided in, with the black press is that the need we had when we started of making sure the positive news about our community was, was dispensed and recorded is still there. We still not, are not getting what, what we think is fair coverage uh, for our community. Also, uh, my news, my paper, I call it a good news newspaper because what we want to do is, is, is record the positive uh, history and, and, and have a positive record, historical record of our community. This week, we're happy to say that, that we featured a couple who, who was celebrating their 72nd wedding anniversary. Now, those were the type of things that didn't make the daily paper. You know, they just, they just went by, but, uh, and, and we do a lot of that. One of the things we're proud of right now also is that when our schools integrated, we lost track. Of, of, of our black youth because they catch a bus in the morning going to school, catch a bus coming in the day. We never knew what happened in between uh, that time. And, and they could live on the same street, different sides of the street. One kid went to Reagan and one went to LBJ. And so that was the problem for us. In 1986, uh, I went to a conference of the Newspaper Public Association and our biggest crisis at that time was trying to attract young people to become publishers, or not publishers, but writers and contributors for our newspaper who wanted to become journalists, you know, because they drifted away. And uh, you, you probably heard about the um, Black Journal Association, but, but that was put together by white media that were hiring black students. And they had their own, own uh, association for the black students. And so, and they said, hey, we need somebody to come with, with, with a, 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 an idea of what we can do to attract uh, more students uh, to come back and work for our newspapers. I had a lady who worked for me out of Waco, Texas, by the name of Bobby Hall, and we said, hey, what can we do? And we came back and put together uh, an idea that we would go out and recruit junior and senior high school students to become student writers for our newspaper. And uh, 1986 was when we did that. And we sat down and we talked to a number of companies that we had good relationship uh, at that time, a few remember Southwestern Bell, you know, was, was a good part of the time, University of Texas, uh, Houston Teller University, and several other, a uh, couple of banks, I think Frost Bank was one, and, and asked them if they would support this type of program, but we need them to provide us some kind of stipend. Well, we, well, we didn't want to just ask students to work for us, but we wanted to pay them. Also, that, you know, if you're gonna check, I don't care how much it is, $5, $10, whatever, uh, you work for it. Students uh, didn't have to ask their parents for money. And so we had, uh, I think, nine students came in that first year and said they want, want to work for our newspaper and, and junior and high school students. And we, we hired them, and that became one of, the, one of the more popular sections in our newspaper, and it still is today, uh, 30 years later. And what, we, what they found was, it, when it's integrated also, they put in this tax test. 
the state test. Our kids were flunking miserably on the state test, uh, not because they were not good students, because they didn't know how to write, uh, uh, what, what do you call these things? Um, anyway, you, you had essays. They didn't know how to write essays. They, they didn't know how to put the words together to write a, an essay that was, that was a, that would give them a good grade, you see. And so by them writing for us on our newspaper, they had the fear of writing. And these students took the fear of writing away, for, took the fear of writing, and they enjoyed it. And so as I said again, 30 years later, we're still doing that program. We, we recruit now about 20 students per year who work for our program for all the schools around, Austin, Maynard, Dell Valley, Pflugerville, Round Rock, and that, that sort of thing. Bless you. <laughs> and, uh, and those students still, that, that's, a, that's one of our most popular sections. If you see our paper, get our paper. We, we, we distribute now, now the East Austin, we, we're not an East Austin paper anymore. We, we are the black community paper. And because we have to serve, we have to serve those same areas, Maynard, Pflugerville, Round Rock, Cedar Park, and Austin, because most of us uh, have moved out of Central, Central City, Austin, and uh, because of raising taxes and high popular values, can't afford to say that anymore. I myself live in a senior citizen complex out in Pflugerville, Merle Town. Uh, so we distributed our paper. We still a free circulated paper. That's one thing also that I think it made us unique. We were free circulated paper. We didn't. We never charged a, a, a price for our paper. We just we drop it in buck location, buck drops wherever we can we can find people to take them. And we finally worked out a deal with the HEB food stores. We have nine, they gave us permission to put them in nine of their, their stores. And the majority of our paper is distributed through those HEB stores. The rest of them have still been distributed through our um, churches because most of the churches, black churches, still are in East Austin, although their members have to drive a long ways to get to church. But they're still located in East Austin. So we distribute our churches in some of our neighborhood businesses, like, like the uh, restaurants. Uh, in other neighborhood businesses like that, the who people do still come to town for that. But most of our papers are distributed in, in, in through the uh, outside business stores. Uh, I don't, we can't ask that question yet. You know, what's the future of our papers that we know right now we're still surviving pretty well. 90 years. NNPA was, was, was founded 90 years ago. And as I said, we have about 300 papers that are still active members of the association. And we'll be having our co conference coming up. I have to say it's going to be in Las Vegas in January. We, we used to spend, spend one in, uh, in the, and when they have cold climates many times, they, they go to Bahamas or somewhere. You know, the people from New York, they got to find somewhere to go to get out of the snow and ice. And so we go there, but in, in but in the in the um, this year they, they're going to Las Vegas for whatever reason. But uh, I like Las Vegas, so I don't have a problem with it. Uh, I've been talking for a while. I know we got the fifth fifth thing. I, I want to give you an opportunity because I I know you you might have questions, and I'll be happy to answer any question you might have about us. Raise your hand. She got she got the mic over here. Please stand up and introduce yourself. My name is Ed Underhill. Um, you, did you say Bahamas? You have papers in the Bahamas? We got a couple from the Bahamas, yes. But, but I was saying that, that usually in, in the, in the wintertime, we go to the Bahamas we get, they got, for the people on the East Coast got to get out of the cold weather. Doesn't, the cold weather doesn't affect us here. You know, we get, we get one day of snow like we did this week. That, that lasts overnight and it's gone. <laughs> but up there, I mean, they, they just need to get out of the cold weather. So. But we do have a couple of papers from Bahamas that are members of the association. I have a couple of questions. My name is Glenn Williams. How often does your paper come out, and about how many copies do you print each each time that you? Uh, we, we, we publish six thousand papers per week, and we come out weekly every Friday, every Friday. So uh, we start with a printed on Thursday. But we start distributing them on Thursday, but uh, we guarantee to have them on, on the field by Friday morning. And just one other question. Uh, you give, obviously, you give the positive things. What else do you cover? Do you cover like sports or entertainment, like black uh, 
plays or something like that? What 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 does your paper? We we we, we cover activities of the black community. Yeah, yes, we do we do play entertainment. I think this week we 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 devote a lot of time uh, on on uh, sports because of, because of the fact that the black players have been been uh, taken for taking a knee to protest uh, the mistreatment in the country, but. Nobody picked up on the mistreatment. They always only just picked up and said they've been just disrespectful to the flag and disrespectful to our truth, and that's not what the protest was all about. And so we 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 actually voted most of this issue to, to that issue. Thank you. No, thank you. He's up front again. <laughs> Are there languages like, like Haiti, for example? I mean, do you, um, not every person who is not white speaks English. And what about all those people? I mean, um, you know, Haiti, Canada has uh, two languages, and, um, and I imagine they're not all white people. So your question is, uh, do you I have other it. languages? We, we don't do English. We, we don't have a mother language paper we just we, we just do English yes but thank you that's, that's a good question hi thanks for being here my name is Larry Courts I'm a member of the forum committee okay. how many children or youth do you have contributing to your newspaper we, we usually have about 20 per year during, during the school year we have 20, 20 students all of them don't write every week but usually we have 15 16 of them who write every week uh, are these are they training to write or are you are you teaching them how or they've already been to school and learned how to write no they're in school that, that's the kind of the problem that no one was teaching them to write so we aren't really how can I put it we're not training them to write what, we, what, what we're doing is we're trying to help them improve that writing once, once they write they know what they want to talk about but if they don't put it in the right, right gr grammatical way or, or whatever then, then we assist them in that. We advise them in that. We also have meetings with them once a month to, 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 to review because many of these students also are not participating in extracurricular activities at school. And so we, we, we make this an organization, you know, and we, we take them on, on community activities such as the MLK March and uh, uh, King Celebration and, and those sort of things. Just give them a, a, an extra uh, insight of what's going on in our communities. This is Glenn Williams again. As you know, we've got elections coming up in the spring and in the fall. Does your paper take a role? Do you endorse candidates or do you screen candidates? I, I assume you give political coverage, but do you have a policy as to who, who you endorse or how you endorse? We endorse candidates, yes. We always have. Uh, and the screenings we go to, usually when candidates are running, you know, we, we go to a lot of the screening sessions they have, many of the churches have them, like our organizations have them, we go to those, and uh, we make our decisions based on people we know in, in, in the platform that they put forth. So yeah, you, but, we do, but we do endorse candidates. And so you actually are covering uh, what they're saying in the, in the churches and in forums and things like that? Uh, some of it. I mean, we, 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 we can't cover all of it sure. because they <laughs> they out they out every other night, you know. But but we do co co cover some of it. But we want we want to give the community uh, a good a good uh, representation of who the candidates are and what they represent. Now, this, uh, one last, uh, as you indicated, the black community has been dispersed. Do you uh, go to like Pflugerville and, and Round Rock? Do you endorse candidates? For example, you've got a candidate running for a city council who is very active in, in, at least in Williamson County black community. Do you cover her campaign as well? Well, well this, this, is, this is new. We're trying to. We, we, we have a, a reporter in, in the Round Rock area who goes to a lot of the forums and, and, and write up organizations, but write up information about what, what the county is talking about. Uh, so yes, we, we are, this, this will be our first time actually uh, uh, in Dawson County outside of Austin because this is kind of a new phenomenon for us trying to keep up with who, this, well, who they are. I encourage you to continue doing that because I think it really will, will be helpful. I think thank we you. probably will because our community has, has, has moved out there in right. large numbers. Great, thank you. Thank you.
Oh, uh, Dan, you touched on it earlier, but um, the uh, mainstream media um, portrayal of the black community um, since your time starting this paper, do you think it's changed over time until now, and, and what do you see the future um, of that portrayal? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. I guess has the, has the portrayal of the black community changed in mainstream media or mainstream newspapers since you've started, and do you see it changing in the future? It hasn't changed so far. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't expect to see it to change. I think we still have the same role. I think that's why uh, black black press is kind of hanging on because we do serve that role that nobody else nobody else serves. And I think it's important not, not just black communities, but there are other community papers. You know, we got the Asian community got their own newspapers. The Hispanic community have their own newspapers. So, you know, because there are, there are specific uh, things that happen in, in in each one of our individual communities that, that doesn't happen that doesn't affect anybody else. So I think there'll be always be a need for those representatives to, to speak for themselves and, and support the activities. So you said you distribute at the HEBs. Um, which HEBs in particular are you distributing at? Well, we, we got two west of I-35. That'll, that'll be Old Toff in Congress, and that'll, mm -hmm. that'll be the Hancock Shopping Center. Mm -hmm. uh, on the uh, other side of Congress, we have at Pleasant Valley Road, HEB. We have the uh, Springdale Shopping Center, Palmer Lane, Wells Branch, and uh, Highway, Highway uh, 79 in Round Rock. Hi, my name's Eric Hartman. I'm interested in the role of the larger association that you're part of. In particular, what kind of support do the various African American newspapers receive around the state, and where where are they actually? Who are your counterparts around Texas? Uh, well, in Dallas, we have three three newspapers in Dallas. We got about four in Houston, so so they, they're really all over. Uh, we got a couple in Abilene, uh, in Texas. We have uh, three a black newspapers in San Antonio. And so they, they really all over. Uh, support the, that the National Newspaper Public Association does is, 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 is try to keep keep the the, the uh, newspapers us on a national basis. So we won't be isolated to just those cities wh where we operate. But if there's a uh, alarm at the gate, then it goes out to everybody, you know, and they encourage us to 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 record that and to publicize that what's going on. Just like we talked about a minute ago about the problem that the athletes are having about this kneeling thing, you know. I mean, they, they were greatly uh, uh, misrepresented on, on what that was all about. And so we have the responsibility then to go out and, and try to explain this, this movement, you know, uh, to the community. So it's not just, it's not at all about the flag and national anthem. It's, 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 it's about the killing of black men, shooting them in the back. I mean, I think you probably was as shocked as I was this week when, when the court finally convicted the guy for shooting the guy in the back five times and throwing and throwing a gun down and he'd gotten away with it all this. You know, and he's one of the few in the country out of all the black men who've been killed, unarmed, been killed, uh, he's the first police officer who, who's been convicted uh, uh, and, and treated that as, as a crime. So that's our role and that's, that's what we're trying to do. Shirley Weiler. Um, so you give out free newspapers. How do you afford to do that? Is it advertising or? It's advertising. Okay. It's advertising. We've been totally on advertising. Wow. Uh -huh. Okay. Good and, uh, and we ain't making enough money to get rich, but we, <laughs> we're making enough <laughs> to keep printing the newspapers. Did you bring any papers along with you today? Well, Luther came over the other day and picked up some, so he was okay. going to strip them. Okay, I think he said there's so I think all, yeah. I, all I have is one. Okay, I, that's I what it looks here. like. Copy of it. Uh -huh. well, Luther picked up. He picked up a, a, a dozen. So the other day, said he's going to shoot him, but now nah, okay. he might still he might still be in his car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to go get him? Would you mind going to get him in the mm -hmm. lobby? Mm -hmm. Thanks. It, it, it also show you we're looking at the, the, the youth brigade section. We got two pages that we do for youth brigade every week, 
and the reason what some of these kids are talking about. I mean, without, without them, we wouldn't know half the things that's going on in our schools. I remember one of our, our big youth brigade stories was one of our students wrote, she, she went to school in, in South Austin, and she wrote about trash on, 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 on school grounds, you know, and she just said, what a shame, you know, that the community is using the, the school ground as a tumbling ground, and that pile had gotten uh, huge so high, you know. And so uh, after we published that article, someone from the district went out and, and looked to see what they were talking about, and mysteriously, in two days, that whole pile of trash left and it never returned. But we wouldn't have known about it if the student ha hadn't made that complaint. Because sometimes, some things just go without us knowing because it's not affecting us, you know. But the students were being affected by all this garbage on the school ground. So the youth are all high school youth, or do you reach out to the junior highs too, or are the youth all high school age? We reach out to all school age youth. Oh, okay. Even and elementary we, school we, too. We have some who are in the, in the fifth grade, sixth grade. Excellent. Yeah, and uh, and you'd be amazed at, at how those kids can write. I mean, the, what's on their mind, what they're talking about. Um, but we read to all youth. Yeah, and, and Zach, at this point, since we're doing it so long, we got second second generation youth now who working for us. Their parents were that when they were students. Uh, Gary Bennett, uh, my uh, you, you point out that uh, a lot of things about the black community in this uh, country are misrepresented in the mainstream press. Um, do you make any effort to try to extend the circulation to some of the white folks that really might need to hear some of this stuff? The paper's free, it's open to everybody. Yeah. You uh, know, and, we, and that's why we put it in HEBs and other stores where it's not just in the black community. You know, when, when we initially started, we majority of our people were in Central East Austin, but not anymore. They're all over town. And as I said again, we were able to work out this uh, this yeah. deal with HEB where they, they permitted us to put the papers in our store without charging us a fee. They ch first wanted to charge us a fee, but we couldn't afford to pay the fee. And so they finally backed off and gave us those nine stores uh, without that we could do it. And, and I can tell you now, uh, when those papers are leaving, they're not all us, all black folks taking those papers. When we go, we drop it down on Friday, we, Sunday, uh, uh, Sunday morning, all those papers are gone. I mean, we like like one of the stores, we, we put about 2,000 papers in the Palmer Lane store, and they don't last more than two days. That's wonderful. But thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we try to reach out to everybody, but, but if, and if you uh, live in the area and you want to know where we distribute, we'd be happy to tell you that. But also, our, our paper's uploaded to, to our website every week. It's theaustinvillager.com, and the entire paper, is print, including advertisers, are printed on that website. And so advertisers get, 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 get free coverage there because we don't charge them extra for, for putting it on the website. Pat Bula, um, have you ever had anything so controversial that you had a lot of complaints or threats or anything like that? I've never, had, I've had a lot of complaints. I've never had a threat so far, you know, and, and some things are very controversial. We, we, but we cover those. We, we, don't, we don't run away from the controversial things. But, I, but lucky, I've, nev I've never had a threat. Another question for you. Uh, I noted quite an impressive record of civic involvement on your part, serving on many boards and commissions, city and county. And I'm interested in your experience doing that and how you felt as a voice for the black community, which successes you would point to, which frustrations you experienced, what you think about the quality of the opportunities that are given to get involved in city and county affairs. Boy, we only got an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, when I first came here, Austin was still just bad. It was still actually completely segregated, I mean, you know, but, but one thing about Austin, I found that, that the black community and the white community get, got along, you know, but we're still segregated. I was the first African American in Austin to join the, uh, at that time, they, they called the, the uh, 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 Chamber of Commerce, the, uh, the Junior Chamber of Commerce. I was the first black to join that organization. And because I, you know, you, you, as you're out there, you run into people and they invite you 
to come in. But what happened was it, it wasn't that black blacks had not been invited. It's just none of them showed up. None of them went. Didn't want to be involved. Didn't want to be a standout. Or I don't I don't know what the reason was. And also I, I transferred that. And by the time I left there, because you know junior chamber of commerce, you you could couldn't be more than 31, and you had to get out because that's why they call it the junior chamber of commerce. But by the time I left, I had at least five people that I, I encouraged to join an organization. And now several organizations like that, you know, that the Life Underwriters Association, where all the insurance agents met, met once a month, had lunch, and talked about how to sell a million dollars to life insurance. I was the first black in Austin to join an organization. Many of them had been invited, but they didn't, they didn't choose to participate. But again, you know, someone has to, has to break the ice. And um, I was actually, uh, uh, how can I say, surprised and delighted someone would ask me to join. And I'll tell you now, when I joined the Junior Chamber of Commerce, the night that the board approved my, my, uh, my application, five board members quit that night. They came back later, but they quit that night because they were so opposed to integrating that organization. So, you know, we went through a lot of those, but, but it wasn't anything uh, disturbing. I mean, people just, just expressed that point of view, you know. And that's, again, some of those guys who quit, end up later being, being some of my uh, best associates. Uh, yes, sir. My name's Luther Elmore. And uh, in uh, kind of following up on that uh, st uh, stream of thought with the racial divide, uh, this week you had a couple of articles about the NFL and Colin Kaepernick and the controversy uh, with the football players kneeling. Uh, what do you see as a the future there? And here the NFL has is pledging, I think, $90 million to address these issues, but uh, what do you see as the future of the protest uh, in the NFL and uh, uh, the, over the Colin Kaepernick issue? I think that the owners finally got the word. You know, this, this playing the national anthem before a football game was, was, was a new development. You know, they didn't do it before. The players never came out of, out, out of the room until the national anthem had been played. But somehow the NFL cut a deal with an advertiser that asked them to do it, and they did it. <clears throat> and but but uh, I think uh, we, we're going to see a big change in the NFL because of that. Because finally the word is getting out of why they were doing it. I mean, as long as it was Colin Kaepernick by himself, you know, that was fine. But when you get the majority of the NFL uh, taking taking part, then you have to you have to address that. And what the, what they've done already. It's told the players they can stay in the locker room until after the, until after the national anthem is played, which which was the old system, you know. And so that's one move right there. Now, where they plan to invest the money, uh, uh, the, the nine million, whatever, where they plan to invest, I don't have any idea where that, where that money is going. But I guarantee you, uh, they're going to try to retain those football players. And and uh, uh, I just I just think it was just egregious for for for, the, for them to label that, that demonstration about how they labeled it because it was, wasn't anything about what it was all about. All right, if we don't have any other questions, we're just gonna cut our forum a little bit short today. Let's give them a hand, please. Thank you for coming and speaking. Thank, to you. Me. Thank you so much.